In this video, we define elementary concepts that are going to be important as we study thermodynamics. Okay, so thermodynamics is the study of uh, energy and energy transfer between systems. So the first thing that we need to define is what energy is. Right, so energy is the ability to do work. And then energy has the units of joule, uh, or in chemical systems, it's more common to use joules per mole or kilojoules per mole. Okay, so uh, there are two types of energy in general, which are going to be kinetic and potential. The difference between uh, these two types of energies is uh, pretty simple to define. Kinetic energy is due to motion, and potential energy is due to position or composition. Kinetic energy is quite simple to define uh, from a microscopic perspective uh, in a classical way, not quantum mechanical way. And the kinetic energy is always, uh, in that sense, one half mass velocity squared. So you can clearly see from that expression, which is fully classical, uh, that that type of energy is due to motion. Okay, now potential energy is more difficult to define because it has, uh, it comes in very many flavors. Okay, uh, but essentially it's just due to position or composition, right? So a typical uh, type of potential energy that we're all familiar with will be gravitational energy, right? So uh, again, there are many types of potential energy, but one of them, which is gravitational energy, is simply MGH, where you can clearly see that that energy is due to your height or to your position. Okay, so uh, uh, that is kind of the definition of energy in the two variants, kinetic and potential. All right, so for a molecular system, uh, uh, the potential energy here, uh, the calculation of the potential energy is extremely difficult because you would need to calculate all of the possible interactions that you have uh, between the particles of your system, right? So if you have a, mo a molecule, then you would need to compute all of the interactions between the electrons and the protons of the nucleus uh, uh, of that of those, uh, system, uh, uh, proton-proton repulsions, electron-electron repulsions, and interactions. And that turns out to be uh, exceedingly difficult. But, but that, in, 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 in essence, that's what the potential energy of your molecule would be. OK, great. Uh, we're going to continue to define here terms that will be used later on in our discussion. Uh, we're always going to be studying transfer of energy between system and surroundings. OK, so let's define what uh, system and surroundings, uh, uh, what those terms are. Well, so the system is simply the, the, uh, the region of space that we're interested in. And this can be uh, almost anything, right? We may be interested in a chemical reaction, right? So suppose that you have here a uh, flask, uh, and then you put here your chemical reaction, uh, your reagent A and your reagent B, right? So uh, in that type of case, the system will simply be the chemical reaction. Okay, and the surroundings is the rest of the universe that is not the system. So in this particular case, if the system is the reaction, then the surroundings are going to be everything else. So that would be in, uh, this flask, the walls of the flask, that piston that can go up and down, and then the air that is nearby, and then the rest of the universe. Okay, that's, that's uh, uh, what the difference is. Now it's pretty obvious that um, uh, the system can, can be anything, right? It can be a cell, it can be uh, uh, perhaps a, a mass traveling through space, right? Uh, but that is all, always going to be a relatively small uh, region of space. The surroundings, uh, uh, on the contrary, is going to be a huge region of space. And any change to the surroundings from a transfer of energy uh, you know, to or from a system will be really, really tiny. In fact, it will be, they will be infinitesimal. Right? So again, changes to the surroundings are always going to be at really small uh, amount compared to the size of the entire surroundings. All right, so we have defined then system and surroundings. Uh, we're going to go back to the system and then uh, say that there's going to be three types of systems. They're going to be uh, either open, closed, or isolated. Okay, systems, you can have either open, closed, and then isolated. All right, so open systems are, are easy to define. Uh, open systems are those in which you have both energy transfer uh, between system and surroundings and mass transfer between system and surroundings, right? So uh, this uh, system would not be open, but if you put here uh, an aperture, 
a lead mass uh, uh, exchange between the surroundings and the system, then that would be an open system. A closed system would be a system in which you have energy transfer between system and surroundings, but no mass, tra mass transfer. Right? So if you actually uh, constrain the flow of mass uh, of molecules between the system and the surroundings, right? so if you don't let that happen, then uh, that would be a closed system. This system can still exchange uh, energy with the surroundings, right? If you hit this with a Bunsen burner, then the reaction is going to get hotter. Okay, or maybe the reaction is uh, generating a lot of energy, it can transfer that to the surroundings, and you, you will see that that uh, flask is actually hot, right? So, so that would be uh, a closed system, right? because there's energy transfer between system and surroundings, but then there's no mass transfer. And then uh, the last one would be an isolated system in which you don't have either mass transfer or energy transfer. Right? So, so the definition of an isolated system would be something where you actually insulate this very, very well, right? so that there's no mass transfer, and then this insulation uh, uh, prohibits or prevents energy transfer between system and surroundings. Now, these are only uh, hypothetical models because we, we can't construct a system that is perfectly isolated. Eventually, uh, if you uh, let enough time go by, there's always going to be some sort of energy exchange between systems and surroundings. Still, uh, the definition of an isolated system would be important from a theoretical perspective. All right, so after we have defined what energy is and then uh, systems and surroundings, now we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the ways that energy transfer between uh, systems and surroundings. Right, so there's actually only two ways of energy transfer, uh, and one of them is work, the other one is heat. All right, so let's actually write that down because it's uh, kind of important. All right, so energy uh, is one thing, but what we're going to be interested in is energy transfer or energy exchange, right? And there's two ways to transfer uh, energy. One of them is as work, and the other one is as heat. All right, so energy transfer as work is simpler to define than energy transfer as heat. In energy transfer as, as work, what you need to do is you need to move against an opposing force. Okay, every time that you're uh, uh, exchanging energy with a system and there's the motion, the uniform motion against an opposing force that is well directed, then uh, that would be work. For example, suppose that you have here this chemical reaction right there and uh, there's uh, an expansion of the gas and then what happens is that uh, this piston that is movable is being pushed out, right? So at the end of the uh, process, you will have the piston a little bit higher than what you had before, right? So what has happened is that, well, the system has pushed out that piston in the surroundings, and uh, that has actually transferred some, transfer some energy, right? So uh, because the, uh, that motion of these pistons has been as, uh, against an opposing force, which in this case would be the mass of that piston, or perhaps collisions with the uh, gases in the atmosphere that are pushing down the piston, right? Because you're moving against an opposing force, then that's what we call work. Okay, so again, it's quite important to remember that you need an opposing force, and generally what happens is that uh, this work requires some sort of a uniform motion. Right? In this case, the, the uniform motion has been that piston moving, uh, all of the molecules moving at the same time, okay, from the system uh, out towards the surroundings. All right, so then uh, we have to find what work is, now we have to define what heat is. Right? So well, the, what we're going to say about heat for now is that is any type of energy transfer that is not work. Okay, Since there's only two types of energy transfer and we know what work is, then whatever is not work then has to be heat. Generally, uh, the most common form of energy transfer as heat is going to be uh, one that happens when you have a difference in temperature between two bodies. Right? So if your uh, surroundings are at a high temperature and then your system is at a cold temperature, then there's going to be an energy transfer as heat from the hot body to the cold body, right? So that is that is the most common type of uh, energy transfer as heat. However, it is not always the case that you need a difference in temperature to transfer energy as heat. It's also possible that you will have the systems and surroundings at the same temperature and they might exchange heat. Okay, so we'll have to define that a little bit later on. Yes, to uh, wrap this discussion up, we're actually going to uh, come here with an applied uh, system and then examine uh, energy uh, transfers as both work and heat. Okay, so our, uh, we're going to come up here with a chemical reaction, which is going to be 
the combustion of urea. Okay, so urea is this molecule, which is a solid, and we're going to burn it with oxygen, which is a gas, to generate CO2, which is a gas, nitrogen, which is a gas, and then water in liquid form. Okay, that is the reaction that we're going to do. Again, this is the burning of urea with uh, oxygen. All right, we're going to do this in a special setup, uh, which is just a, a cylinder, which is fitted with a movable, movable piston. Right, so the piston can go uh, up and down, and there's no friction between the piston and the walls. Okay, but that is going to allow us to track work quite easily. Right, so initially we put here our urea, that is uh, our solid, and then we put uh, three and a half moles of oxygen as a gas uh, for every mole of urea. And again, that's a piston. And then we just let the reaction go. Okay, so what will happen in the reaction is as follows. Uh, no notice that for every one and a half moles of gas that you have in reagents, you're generating a total of two moles of uh, gas in products. So what you actually have here is something that is called a gas expansion. Right? Uh, the idea is that um, if the pressure that you have uh, this piston under is constant, okay, then uh, you're actually going to be able to push that piston out because uh, uh, the pressure inside the system is increasing okay, as, as you're putting more and more uh, molecules in the gas phase. Right? So uh, the end of this might look like this, where you actually have pushed the system out a little bit, and now you have your N2, you have here your CO2, and you also have water as a liquid. Okay, so clearly uh, during the reaction there has been an energy transfer as work from the system to the surroundings, right? Uh, the system has pushed out the piston that belongs to the surroundings, and now maybe that that, uh, that energy can be used for something else. Maybe you can couple this to a crankshaft and then uh, move the wheels of a car, for example. Okay, but there's something else that has happened. It turns out that if you actually put this in a bath of ice, okay, so this is where you will have ice. What you will see is that uh, at the end of the reaction, some of the ice has actually melted as liquid water. Okay, so there has been also energy transfer as heat, right? Uh, and again, we can track both of them uh, pretty sim simply. First, the energy transfer as work uh, has been because you have uh, moved against an opposing force, in, a, in, in this case a piston, and then there's also been energy transfer as heat, okay, because uh, uh, you can see that some of the ice that was surrounding uh, this reaction uh, vessel initially has been melted, right? So that, that means that uh, some of the energy generated in, during the reaction has been transferred to that surroundings, to that ice, and the consequence of that is that uh, uh, some ice has melted. Okay, so uh, that is kind of an example of how you can do a thermodynamic uh, uh, problem uh, and visualize how the transfer of energy as work and heat take place. Okay, something interesting that we could do is to start to see how uh, uh, the transfer of energy as work and heat are equivalent. Okay, so we could actually design an experiment in which instead of letting this uh, piston move, we're actually going to lock it into place. Right? So we're not going to allow for any, any energy transfer as work. Right? The only way that you can transfer energy here is going to be as heat. What we actually then observe is that if you lock the piston into place, then there's more ice that melts than what you would actually obtain if you were uh, to allow the piston to move up and down. Okay, so that tells you that the same process, that chemical reaction, right, whenever you let, uh, leave it unconstrained, then you might have two types of energy transfer, work and heat. But if you block one of them, then you will get more uh, of the energy transfer as heat. Okay, so this is kind of a, a, a preliminary example for the equivalence between the types of energy transfer. All right, so in uh, this video, we have uh, given a, a very a brief introduction to elementary concepts that we're going to need as we study thermodynamics. In the next videos, we're going to try to define very carefully uh, what work is and then what heat is.